Good morning. Good to see you again this morning. I know last week we said we weren't going to meet uh, this Sunday, but I've changed my mind. And I want to meet with you and continue what we've been doing. So we're going to be doing some of this with our church this morning, but I wanted to communicate with you as well who are watching. So we want to welcome you. We're glad to have you with us. We're moving towards a series that we're going to open up in a couple weeks. But we're talking about our culture. We're talking about how to engage our culture, understanding our culture. What does that mean? The mission for our church, really the mission for your life, for my life as a child of God, as a believer. What's essential? What's important? So really the goal is not only to know these things, but to mobilize together. Mobilize together as believers, no matter where you're living or in your church here together, to, that God would mobilize us together to reach our world for Jesus Christ. And so that's, that becomes our focus here as a church, and that's what we want to focus on this morning, reaching our world for Jesus Christ, wherever that is and wherever you live. The first thing that we need to understand is just the most important, the most essential is what is the mission that God's given to us? What is it he's, that is he calling us to? What is he calling you to? Uh, if you're a, uh, in school or out of school, you're living, you're near retired, you know, the mission that the Lord places on our life is, is the mission of a child of God, no matter what stage we are at in life. It doesn't matter how young we are or how old we are. Doesn't ma- Any of those things don't matter. As long as we have life and breath, there is a mission that God has given to every believer to continue and to be involved in. And the church is, is to... Sh- is to unite together in that. We looked at this last week, and I want to bring it before our attention again because it's so important. It is the, it is the foundation for really everything. And so let's talk about that this morning. Again, the mission is this. It's evangelism and it's discipleship. From Matthew 28 and so many other places, we're simply called to go. We are going here. It's, it's, it's assumed, and the Scriptures call us to go and to be a life witness and, and to make disciples to draw others to Christ, to teach them obedience in Christ, to teach them to grow in Jesus Christ once we step into that relationship through faith in Christ. The great motivator behind that, as we saw last week, is is that vertical relationship. It's, It's our love for God and understanding His deep love for us. It's, it's never, it's never coming to grips with how much God truly loves us. It's never, it's never fully understanding but appreciating with everything that we are and have God loves us, and it changed everything, and it changes everything in our life. And we're called to love Him in return with with our whole heart. With everything that we are, we're called to love Him with the same love in which He loved us. It becomes the motivator that that undergirds and strengthens and enables the mission to take place of reaching people for Christ and of making disciples. What happens then is that the character of God is, is poured into my life. When I receive His love, and when I love Him back, then the character of Christ is is laid over my heart and laid into my heart and begins to make the difference in my life. And and so we share this together, the character of love. It's, It's what defines us. Everyone will know a genuine believer by the character of Christ in their life, by the love of God in their life. That is the fruit of the Spirit, that very first fruit, uh, the very first piece of fruit that's mentioned in that that text, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, is love. It really defines everything else. Everything else is an expression of God's love in our life. It is that love which which gives us power and gives us authenticity and and gives us an open door. And it's expressed in our life, in all of our relationships. Really, the mission for the church is found in relationships. It's found in believers reaching out to people. It is relational. And we're going to our enemies, our neighbor. We're going to the body of Christ. We're loving, we're loving those who are outside the church. We're loving those who are part of the church. It is the love of God that defines all of those relationships, all of those endeavors. The mission that is, that is carried out to, to, to reach people for Christ and to be disciples, it happens because of love is first present in your life and in mine. The love of God, it's, it's transformative. And so we put these things together, we put them into a worldview. We mobilize around just a biblical understanding of how we are to function as believers and what is it that God would have us to do. <clears throat> so we've used the acronym here in Emmanuel, O-H-I-O, and we've touched base on this, but it's a beautiful way of just helping us to look at the biblical purposes that, that Christ has for his church. The first one is, is that O, oh, it is outward, it is, it is an evangelistic focus. It's having a heart for, for people who are lost. Simply, simply caring about people that are lost. It's being welcoming in, in our church and in our life. 
It's, it's going and, and it's inviting people. It's, it's welcoming them into relationship. It's showing the love of Christ. But then it's being active and it's also going outside the doors of the church and outside of comfort zones and engaging people. We're going to see that. Uh, it is proclaiming Christ. It's living for Jesus Christ. It's proclaiming him with our words, with, with, our, with our life, with our lips, and, and, and living for him. <clears throat> it's taking ministry off-site. You know, evangelism isn't about the church. It's not about location. It's not about a building. It's about the church being in the world. And so we go into our world and we and we reach people for Christ. It's grounded in prayer. It's 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 praying for people who need the Lord. It's it's you and I praying for people around us who need the Lord. And it's personal. It's doing everything that we can to facilitate these relationships and to support them and to undergird them, to resource them. It's it's all about relationship. That's what it's about. And then it's the church just being, uh, just being joyful. When someone comes to know Christ, it's celebrating that. It's celebrating open doors. It's celebrating another step that God is moving someone towards Christ and towards salvation. It's, it's, it's putting all of that in the context. This is God at work and God doing something powerful. Evangelism is a reflection of your heart and my heart. Whenever evangelism takes place, it's because God has touched your heart and mine. So what comes from our heart? What, what's happening in our heart if, when a child of God is active in evangelism? Well, we're sharing. We're sharing the gospel. We're sharing the word of God. And it reflects this, that you and I, we know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God loves us. And because I know that God loves me, it, it motivates me. It changes everything that I do. It becomes a catalyst in my life to reach out. And so I continually find myself just thanking God. I go, I, I share Jesus Christ, and the believer shares Jesus Christ with people who need the Lord because we never forget that everything that we have in Christ is undeserved. Our status before God is undeserved. Our privilege before God is undeserved. Our promise in Christ is undeserved. And all these things are true, and we never forget that. And because we never forget that, and because Thanksgiving floods our heart, we take, we take that message and we share it with others who need the Lord. And we view others through their need. Everyone without Christ has an eternal need. Everyone without Christ has a destiny that will either be with the Lord or without. And, and, and there's a, a burden on our heart that people need the Lord. We don't see them through the trouble that they might be or through the difficult personalities that they might be. We see them through their need. We see them through the fact that they need a Savior. That never changes. And so we extend grace. We extend the grace that God has given to us. We are recipients of grace, and, and so in evangelism, we seek to always be people of grace. And no matter who we're reaching, and no matter the condition of their life, and no matter how they treat us, or how rough around the edges they are, or the scars in their life, we extend grace because grace was extended to us. We care. We care for people. That's the condition of your heart and mind when we, when we are active in evangelism. And if the Lord is touching your life to be obedient in this area, this is why. Because these things are... are are being reflected in your own heart and we build genuine relationships we care for people we genuinely care for people we're praying for people we're praying for the lost and we're praying for them by name and we're sharing that with the church and we're praying together that god would touch hearts we're living for jesus christ because testimony and witnesses is our life it's how we live in in harmony with the word of god and and we're willing and we say lord lord Use me, Lord, send me, send me out. Where would you have me to go today? How would you have me to make a difference today? That's the key. And then we simply do this, we give dignity. We give dignity to those who don't deserve it. Image bearers, those who that image has been tainted by sin, like in our life. We extend grace and we extend dignity and we honor and respect those who who maybe be our enemies, and we use that, and that's a part of the testimony of grace of God in our life that he uses. We'll talk about that too. What's revealed ultimately when we're active in evangelism is the grace of God. Simply by the fact that you care enough to share the good news of the gospel displays God's grace, that you've been touched by his grace, and you want to share that grace with others who don't deserve it, just as you and I didn't deserve it as well. The second element there is, is O-H. It's just worship. It's a heavenward focus. It's, it's our focus on Christ. It's that, it's that vertical relationship. And so we come together in the church, and when we come, we're expectant. 
We're expecting God to do something in our heart. When we come to his word, we're expecting God to do something and we're yielded. We're saying, God, teach me, use me, show me, change me. That's what we're, it's all about that. And, and so the church is, is committed to, to moving and, and challenging believers to have a life response to Christ, to continually be responding to Jesus Christ. And so we encourage relationship. We encourage the sharing of prayer, praying for one another, the sharing of needs. We're authentic. We come together and as we worship, we, we communicate, you know what, I, I need the Lord. And, and I come and worship because I need Him. I need, I need the power that only He can give. And I, and I need, need the encouragement of the body of Christ. And I, and I, need, how, I need all that God's provided. And, and everything that I need, it's from Him. And, it's, and, I, and I just can't produce it myself. And God, I need you. And we come together in this plea together and we worship him. And that's what we do. And we and so we celebrate together with God. When victories happen in our life, we celebrate that. And we share that with one another. So God gets the glory. And so worship takes place. And as we grow, as needs are met, and as we as God answers prayer and praise is lifted up, and together we we are worshiping God and elevating him and exalting him. And so prayer is a constant the constant oil of our life. It's the constant necessity of our life as we say, Lord, I need you. We praise him continually. We build in praise to our life. It touches our heart. When we worship, we conform to the Lord. That's what we do. We are conforming ourselves to the standard of Christ. When we worship, we're saying, Lord, it's all about you. It's all about you. And when he touches my heart and we worship, we worship because we know that God loves us so much. We're touched we're touched by the love of God. And we take the Lord and we, and, we, and we put Him first in our life. And we elevate Him to the first place in our life. That's what we do. We yield to Him. He becomes the standard for our life. And so as we're making decisions and as we're laying goals in front of us for the week and we're establishing priorities, we're saying this, Lord, if it be your will, then let it be done. If this is your will, Lord, this is what I want to do. Lord, show me your will. God, it's about you. I want to do what you would have me to do today and this week. Lord, my greatest purpose today as I go to work isn't just to complete the project, the task, the mission that my boss gives me. My highest project, my highest goal, my highest desire today is to honor you. So how can I do that in everything that I do? And so my heart is this. Lord, I want to conform to you. So Lord, give me a teachable spirit. Help me to learn from you continually. Help me to do that. Help me to live today in awareness of your presence. Everywhere I go, your presence so that you might work on my behalf. Your presence so that you might use me for your glory. Your presence that you might give me strength and wisdom for the moment. God, you're present. And so I conform to you and I yield to you. God, give me a clean conscience. That's part of conforming. God, give me, give me the, the, re, the reminder that I need to, to confess sin on a regular basis and have a clear conscience before you. God, that I might... That I might um, repent of sin and turn from that and continually be turning from things that would that would pull me away from you and draw me from you and lord ultimately just be honored in my life be glorified today in what i do that's my prayer today god help me to help would you be honored would you be magnified in my life today in what i do what's revealed in the heart of god and genuine child of god is this it's relationship when we worship then relationship is revealed people see that that there is something genuine that's there in, in my connection, my relationship with God. God is revealed in my life. When we encounter others and engage them, when there is a relationship, it changes everything. When the name of Jesus Christ is stamped across my life, it changes everything. When church is stamped across my life, that doesn't change things. When faithfulness and serving is across my life, it doesn't change things unless Jesus Christ first is stamped across my life. The, the, the third element here is inward. It's, it's that focus on, on just having a love and a passion for one another. Um, it is committed to serving. It is a commitment to serving one another. It's, it's a commitment to the one another principles of the Word of God. We keep those in front of us. God, God's desire is that we be putting the needs of others first, continually before our own needs, to serve one another, to be putting these these mandates in action in our life. It's, it's maintaining relationships. It's strengthening relationships. People who aren't with us, it's staying engaged with their life and caring about them. It's caring about one another. It's, it's, it's staying together in, in relationship in small groups and staying connected and being real and authentic and, and all of these things. But 
But this inward focus, it comes uh, from our life and it touches our heart first. And we look at Christ and, and He gives us the heart of service. He gives us the heart of a servant. That's what He does in our life. And we are reminded from a heart that God has given us everything that we need to serve Him. He's given us everything that we need for life and practice, life and godliness. There's nothing that is missing in our ability to do the will of God in our life. He's given us everything. We might serve Him well. And so we learn from Christ. Our heart, we come before the Lord and we say, Lord, teach me to serve as You served us, as You served me. As we saw in the Gospel of John, the the servant's heart of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As He went to the cross, He continued to serve His disciples. He served us. He serves us each and every day. And He desires that we learn from Him. That we esteem each other with dignity. We serve each other when we respect one another, when we honor one another. Even when it's a difficult person, God puts within your heart and my heart that passion, that desire. When we just use those graces that God has given us, those talents, those abilities... They're not for us. They're not about ourselves. They're not about making a name for ourselves. God's given them to us that we might use them to serve others, to benefit the body of Christ. And when we know and understand that when we serve, we truly serve for the glory of God, then we truly touch a heart. We truly change somebody's life. You know, there are many who come to church who are isolated, who are on the fringes. One of the reasons that's true is because is because that person never takes the opportunity to get to know someone else and to serve another. When we serve others, Christ comes alive in our life. We're not to come to church or come into relationship and just live for ourselves. One of the sad things is to be a part of a church and never function in a church. Never be active in a church. Never use what God's given you for the benefit of the body of Christ. That's this third element. And when we serve and our heart is conformed to Christ in this area, What's revealed is this, a, a commitment, Lord, use me. What's, Lord, use me. And, and what we see is simply here a servant's heart. A servant's heart. The last one is, is the commitment to move forward. It's, it's a sustained commitment in our life. It's having a love for God's Word in our life. And that love never, never, never fails. That love grows stronger as we walk with Jesus Christ. It's, it's, it's personal growth. It's sustained growth. It's intentional growth in our life. It's opening the Word of God. That we might learn from Christ. That we might learn God's heart. That Christ might be brought into our life. We'd be conformed to His image. That His life would be the character of our life. Life obedience is what must be encouraged in the life of the church. We teach these things, obedience to Jesus Christ. We teach the need for personal growth, sustained growth. And you and I are always changing, always changing. It is the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our life. We're always listening to the ministry of the Holy Spirit and following after Him that the fruit of His work would be, would be revealed in our life, the fruit of the Spirit. That there is repentance, that there is revival, that there is renewal taking place in our life. Not just big revival, not just big renewal, but, but small steps of, of just renewal each week that sustain us and nourish us and feed us and continue to keep us moving forward for Christ. When He touches our heart, when this commitment happens in our life, it's because the Lord has touched our heart. These are all heart matters. All of these are heart matters. And it's a realization the character of Christ is then implemented in my life. I conform to His standard when I worship. But when I, when, I, when I fulfill this commitment and I stay focused and I'm faithful to the very end, it's because what I conform to in my heart, it's now being imprinted on my life. And my life is being characterized by the, by the character of Jesus Christ. And I'm reminded that God has supplied every need in my life, everything that I need. And so it becomes a reminder in my life that God heals. He heals every brokenness. And He renews. He renews and restores in my life. And He walks before me. He walks before me so that I might follow after Him. And I'm never alone. I'm never alone. He wants me to follow after His heart and say, God, what would you have me to do? And He delights in using us. Isn't that amazing? God delights in us. He praises his work in our life. He wants us to, to serve Him and to love Him and to be used for Him. And He delights in that. And, it re, and it all, it's revealed in our heart here and we just simply make this commitment, Lord, change me. This is the, this is the greatest challenge of, a, of the heart of a believer. And when we find ourselves at this place, God is, is truly working in our life. When we say every day, Lord, change me. Lord, use me. Lord, change me so that I might be conformed to You. That's the commitment. What's revealed in our life is 
is humility. So we're mobilizing. We're mobilizing to reach people for Christ, for disciples. And so we realize that, that what God's called us to, it's ministry, and it's ministry out of the box. Ephesians 5, chapter 4, verse 7 reminds us, grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of God's gift. Grace was given to every one of us, all of us. We recognize the grace of God. All of us have been given abilities. We've all been given what we need to be a witness for Jesus Christ, to encourage the body of Christ. We've been given all of these things. And so we're all very different. We're all very different people. God's given us different abilities. He's given us um, resources that we might use. And so when we, when we look at each other in the body of Christ, it's already out of the box because we look at each, we look at people and we encounter people and we see people that are, man, they're so different than me and they, they think so differently than me and, they, and they're good at these things and I'm not and, and they're not very good at these things and well, I, I'm comfortable in that and we're just so di very different and, and automatically we're just functioning out of the box, out of our comfort zone is what we're doing and God has gifted us for that very purpose. And so we take God's gift, gift and His grace and we put it into action. Ephesians 4, 16. And so the whole body, everyone is, everybody together, every joint with which it is, is equipped, when each part is working properly, it makes the body grow. So why? Here again, it's stamped in love. The body grows in love. That becomes the key. That is ministry out of the box. That is all of us functioning and participating in the body of Christ. It means I have to get out of my comfort zone and serve people who are not like me, who are different than me, and serve them for their benefit, for their growth, that the body of Christ would be built up, Jesus would be glorified, and that the love of Jesus Christ would permeate our ministry. And then, and then we prosper because of that. We thrive. The body of Jesus Christ is built up. Christ is, becomes the, the focal point of a church, and there's a unity that the Lord brings to the church, the unity of mission and the unity of the call of Christ and the unity of, of the body of Christ embracing the need to serve and to grow, to worship, and to go and reach a people for Christ. So we're to be healthy and we're to be functioning. So we have to understand, if we're going to serve the Lord and, and go out and reach people who need Christ, we're going to be out of the box all the time. We're going to be, God's going to be stretching us outside of our comfort zone all the time. So he's calling you out of your comfort zone. He's calling me out of our comfort zone. He's asking you to do what's not comfortable, but what he's equipped you to do. He's asking you to do what seems impossible, but what he's enabled you to do. He's asking you and I to trust him, to take a step of faith, a leap of faith, and to serve and to go out and to engage the world. And so we have to understand that, that Ministry isn't about just, just being in a comfort zone. It's not about just being on site. It's not about just coming to church and getting fed and being around people that we like and know. But it's, 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 it's stepping outside of that. It's not about just ministry and programs. It's much more than that in the life of a church. It's going off site. It's getting, it's getting out, of the, out of the location of the church and into our community and into our lives. It's ministry opportunities that are essentially important, but don't reside, but don't happen just at a church and at a building and at a location. It's not about just taking those programs and ministries and redoing them or reorganizing them or whatever that is. And sometimes those things need to take place, but it's about, it's about people. It's about mobilizing people for ministry. The greatest asset of a church is people. The greatest asset of a church is people in the hands of God. It's people motivated by the love of God, enabled by the grace of God. Matthew chapter 9 reminds us that this is the prayer. God said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few, so pray earnestly that the Lord of the harvest would send out laborers into his field. We're to pray that God would send laborers. God is continually asking you, requiring you and I to step out of our out of the box, out of our comfort zone, and lovingly reach people who need the Lord. That's not just something that happens around the world that missionaries do. That is something that the Lord is calling every individual believer to participate in, to be a part of. Right now as you're listening, right now as I'm preaching, right now as we engage as a church, he's calling us not just as a church, not just as a body of believers, he's calling us as individual believers to be active in taking a witness for Christ to a world who needs a Savior. And so we mobilize. We understand that ministry ultimately is relationship. Ministry is people. Programs are important. Ministry events are important, but what's most important is the people behind them. What's most important is you 
your obedience to the Lord, your service for the Lord, your worship before the Lord, your growth before the Lord, and ultimately your witness for the Lord. It is all relational. Not too long ago, we, we looked at this book together, The Art of Neighboring. It reminded us of, of how we have an opportunity to reach our neighbors and how we can do that, and how we can engage in relationships, how we need to be praying by name for the people who live in the houses right next to us, who, who, who work in the cubicle right next to us, our neighbor right around us. Who are the people that you and I continually see that no one else in your church sees? Who is it that God has put in your path? Who is your neighbor that God wants you to reach? That is a challenge that that book laid before us. A couple of years ago, we looked at this book, the book Tactics. It is a challenge to us to, to look in, and to engage people in a relationship and to bring questions into their life and, and to strive to understand who they are and how God has made them and, and what's important in their lives so, we, so that we can then bring the testimony of the Word of God into conversation and reach them for Jesus Christ. But it begins by genuinely caring for who they are and loving them getting to know them, and then looking for that opportunity to bring the grace of the gospel into conversation and into their life. There's another book that I'm mentioning now and be presenting to the church. It's this. It's Evangelism as Exiles. It's written by Elliot Clark. It's, li it's life on mission as strangers in our own land. It's what we're talking about. So we started last week. It's what's relevant today and what we're going to be talking about next week and in the weeks to come. We're living in a culture that's changing all the time. <laughs> And how do, we, how do we engage a culture that more and more hates Christianity and hates Christians, that doesn't value the gospel message, that doesn't value Christ and Christianity and biblical values? How do we engage that culture? How do we engage those people in our life, those friends in our life, those enemies in our life? How do we do that relationally? This book is all about that. These three resources right here are great resources that I would consider you to have in your in your library, in your life, and be reading them. If you're a member of this church, we have them in a library, and we encourage you to do that. So this is about relationship. We're going to close with this emphasis. Ultimately, as we mobilize, it's around relationship. Relationship in action. And so we come to Colossians chapter 3, and just remind us of how important this is. Colossians chapter 4, verses 3 through 6. The first thing that we understand is this. When we think about taking the gospel to people who need the Lord. And we think about the context of relationship. The first thing that we understand is this, that we need to pray. We need to bathe this in prayer. It is, it is supernatural what we're asking God to do. We're asking God to change a heart. We're asking God to change a life. Only He can do that. We're asking the Spirit to come, to come alongside and to change a life, for He's the only one who does that. He uses us. We are, we are, uh, he gives us the opportunity to share the blessing of seeing come to, someone come to know Christ. He uses us and gives us the opportunity and the blessing to be a witness. That He's the one who changes the heart. And so we pray that God would work. At the same time, pray also for us, Paul prays, that God may what? Well, that God would work. And so we begin here and we say, we pray. And we pray together. We pray by name for people. We pray for opportunities. And we say, God, it is your work. You, God, would you work? On, we pray for your glory. We pray on your behalf. God, would you work and move a heart? God, would you show grace to this person who doesn't deserve it and use me to see them come to know Jesus Christ? This, this ministry of relationship, it's intentional. It's intentional. At the same time, we pray that God would open a door for the Word. We're praying for the Word of God to be used in the heart and life of an individual, for the truth of the Word of God to be used. It is, it is verbal. It is Christ-centered. That we would declare the mystery of Christ. Paul says, on account for which I'm in prison, that I might make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Because I'm in prison because of the gospel. He says, this is my mission. This is my goal. This is what, I'm, this is what it's all about. God has put me here to, to speak for Jesus Christ. He's put me here to be a witness. That I might verbally proclaim good news to prisoners who never would have heard it otherwise. God's giving you and I an opportunity to speak the gospel to someone who maybe otherwise would never hear. We cannot, we cannot take for granted at all anymore. We cannot assume the people we encounter have even ever heard of Jesus Christ, biblically, who even know who He is or what he's, why He died for us, that He even died for us, who even know anything about Christ other than that He's a swear word or something like that. 
Our culture is so different today. We can't ever assume those things. We have to build relationship, build context, and have a verbal witness with the Word of God. We have to verbally share the truth of the Word of God. It is life. It's how we live. That we would make the most of our time. That we would walk in wisdom towards outsiders. That's the unsaved. That God would give us the wisdom, the ability to know how to engage someone who doesn't know Christ. What kind of things to just... Um, to participate in with them, what kind of conversation to have, and, and what kind of example to be in, and how to just show a genuine concern for their life, and things that are happening in their life, and trials and challenges that are happening in their life, and when we come along and we truly care about those things, we open a door. And it's having wisdom to know how to love with a biblical love, and how to show grace to people who are difficult, and maybe, and maybe take every opportunity to undercut who you are, and take every opportunity to hurt you, and to demean you, to make your life miserable, and to have the wisdom to understand that we need to see them through the eyes of grace. We need to see their need and their eternal destiny. Before we see them as a problem and as a challenge, we need to see them through grace. And it is the wisdom of God that leads us to that place. And so we live life. We live our life with wisdom. How can I engage with my life? That I would walk in wisdom. That I would live biblically before them. And then there's an urgency. When we are involved in a, in a relational ministry, there is, there is a patience because relationship takes time. There is sharing the Word of God. There is all these things, but there is a sense of urgency because we don't know when Christ may come. We don't know if someone's life may end. We don't know if that time will pass when God's grace will end. And so we, we look for the moments to share Christ. We look for those moments. And so... I'm calling you and I'm calling me to reach into, into our world. I'm calling you to reach into your world. That God would, that you would say, Lord, use me. Lord, send me. Give me the grace, the burden, the wisdom, the word of God, the knowledge, the spirit of God. Give me all that I need that I might reach the people in my life who need the Lord. God's calling you and he's sending you. He's sending you, no one else. The people in your life that only you know that are unsaved, God's sending you. And he's sending me. If we're going to be a witness, just some final reminders here. He's called us to be a witness. Make it personal. As you engage people, make it personal. Make it personal in your life. You and I go. Go. You and I go. And be. That means be like Christ. Personally, you have to be committed to going. And you have to be committed to living and being like Christ. You have to be what Christ wants you to be. Number two, just make life connections. Engage people. Make those connections. Get to know people. Talk to that waitress. Talk to that guy at the gas station that you see all the time. Make conversation and talk about them. Talk about them. Get to know them. Don't share your life. Talk about them. Get to know them. Listen to them their heart. Build a relationship. Love them. Love them. They may get to know you, but love them first. Take the opportunity to let them get to know that you care. Show that. Invest that in them. And look for opportunities to share the truth, to evangelize, to, to share the gospel. Draw them to Christ. Somehow in everything that, that you pray and you do with an unbeliever, Somehow look for ways to, to draw them to Christ, to draw them into conversation, to be a tangible witness for them, to show them Christ, to praise the Lord for something He's done in your life, to somehow reveal Christ. And, draw, and pray that God would help you to draw them into relationship. Into relationship. Relationship through salvation. Relationship as a child of God once they receive Christ, discipleship. That's what God's called us to do. He's called us to be a witness. It is a relationship. God's calling you and He's calling me. May we embrace that and accept that. It's my prayer for all of us, for our church. This is the essential mission of the church, to go, to be disciples, to make a difference, to be willing individually to be used for the Lord. Lord, we pray that you would imprint this truth from your word on our heart for your glory. Because people need the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us. We'll see you next week.